Once again, we're happy to welcome to our broadcasting studios Clyde L. Hap Whartney, the Regional Eastern Interbureau Coordinator of Administration for the Northeast States. I presume you're here with your report. Uh, I'd like to preface my remarks by thanking the company Mm -hmm. for making available to me this free radio time. I know how valuable it is, and I appreciate it very much. Bob, if you'll fire away now with the questions that I have prepared for you, I'll be very pleased to answer the questions that I have answered here thoroughly. All right. It says, uh, Mr. Watney, uh, do you have any immediate plans for the coming uh, fiscal period in which we're just uh, starting out? I'm glad you asked me that question. Uh... Fiscal has already started, Bob, and we're making great plans for it. For it. Uh, Hap, I wonder if you could uh, give us a little fill-in on what the field representatives have been doing as they uh, have uh, been traveling around New England and the southeast part of Indiana uh, collecting the material which will later be collated for shipment to Washington. Later be collated for shipment to Washington. After they are collated, they will be shipped to Washington where there will be a comprehensive collation done there, and a, and a graph will be drawn so that we'll have a complete picture of everything. everything. Well, then, uh, after that report is uh, submitted uh, to Washington, Washington and returned to you, to what do you do with it? What do I do with it? After that report is returned to me, I then give duplicates to all my field workers, who then go about the... Uh, country talking with the individuals who are most interested in it. Most interested in it. In it. Uh, then what? After that, we return, or they return to my office, where we make a complete report in graph form and then send it along to the Army Engineer. Army Engineer. To the Army Engineer. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Mr. Watney, and we certainly will look forward to your next visit when we hope you'll have more information along these lines. lines. It has been a pleasure, as it always has been, to be here on the National Companies, and thank you. Thank you, sir. The current trend in radio, particularly on a local basis, is the use of the beeper telephone to conduct live interviews with people in the news. Now, there are several advantages to this, such as being able to interview anyone at any time, as long as you can uh, talk to them, call them on the phone, plus the saving in money because extra engineers and announcers are not needed. So, with a nose for news and eye toward saving a buck, we initiate the Bob and Ray Party Line, a feature on which newsworthy people... We'll be interviewed via the beeper phone. Ray, who did you say our first party line call would be to? It's Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler, I believe, whose recent magazine article in Clean House and Sidewalk entitled Kids Are a Pain in the Neck has been widely criticized by the nation's parents. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Frumpweiler is the mother of seven children and the freelance babysitter. I think she's listed in the directory. I have it here. See, uh, Frump, Frumpish, Frumpner, Frumpstein... Here it is, Frumpweiler, Mrs. Amy. Uh, the number is Warbucks 52194. And we'll hope to chat with uh, Mrs. Frumpweiler in just a few seconds. It's ringing now. Hello? Hello. Uh, this is Bob and Ray's party line calling Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler. Ronnie's giving the twins a bath. Do you want to hear me sing the one eyed, one horn, flying purple people later? Uh, no, Sonny, not now. Could you get your mother to the phone, please? Uh, my daddy told my mommy today that the house is always filthy when he comes uh, home. Oh, that's nice. But could, uh, could you call your mommy now? My daddy likes beer a lot. Mm-hmm. Do you want to hear a big airplane flying over a cow and dropping a bag of water on it? I don't believe so. Uh, Flash! <laughs> I just made it up now. Well, that's wonderful. Now, you're a good little boy. Will you go and get your mummy, please? Okay. What's your name, uh, Mr. Donkey Wonky Dookie? Tell her it's uh, radio's famous Bob and Ray Goulding. Bob, Donkey, and Ray Collie. Wonking. Call him Mommy Dookie. Oh, boy. Bob mm. Wonky. Let's say he hung up. Uh, yes, he did. Do you have that number again? <laughs> yes, it's Warbucks 52194. Yeah. Try it again. All right. must have uh, thought I was all through talking to him or something. Hello. 
Marvin, put down that vase. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, Mrs. Frumpweiler. This is Radio's Bob and Ray's party line calling. About your magazine article, kids are a pain uh, in the just neck. Just a minute. Mm. Marvin, I'm not going to tell you again. Put down that vase. Why, you bra- You go to your room and wait till your father comes home. Hello, what did you... Who, who'd you say you were? That vase cost $20. Uh, this is the Bob and Ray party line. Percy, per- you tell the twins to get back in the tub this minute. I'll be right back. Uh, Bob and who did you say? Bob and Ray, uh, we'll call back some other time when you're not so tied up, all Yes, right? why don't you? Mary Lou, did you cram up that wall? Well, that was Mrs. Amy Frumpweiler, our first interview on the new Bob and Ray party line feature. And tune in next time when another name in the news is called on the beeper telephone. Let's not do it again. Say, welcome once again to the Bob and Ray Beg Your Pardon Show. As serious news gatherers and reporters, we are prone to mistakes. Well, we did it again. It was reported at this microphone some time ago that a Mr. Hewlett Tuckering was responsible for the disappearance of a Miss Daisy Merge. What we neglected to say was that Mr. Tuckering was a magician and Miss Merge was his assistant. Mr. Hewlett Tuckering, we're sorry. Well, forget it. Uh, well, what happened after the kidnapping charges that had been lodged against you as a result of our disclosure at this microphone? Oh, the usual. I got ten years in jail. Mm-hmm. Felt that I didn't deserve the sentence, but go fight City Hall. Well, we're awfully sorry. Oh, no, don't be apologetic. You'll become ill if you do. Anyway, it was more Daisy Merge's fault than yours. Uh, what did she do? Well, we were appearing at this theater in Youngstown, and generally I'd close the act by putting Daisy in the disappearing cabinet. The idea was that she'd fall into the cellar and I'd meet her after the show and we'd go out for a bite of food. Uh, didn't she meet you for a bite? Well, I found out later that she met the janitor of the theater down in the cellar. I guess they kind of liked each other. They both went off to Pittsburgh. And, of course, you didn't know that at the time. No, I thought she disappeared. There's a lot I don't know about magic. Mm-hmm. Well, we thought she disappeared, too. That's why we reported uh, that at the microphone. Well, don't fret about it, then. See how easy it is to make a mistake. Well, now, after you started your jail sentence, why didn't Daisy Merridge step forward and and admit that she hadn't disappeared? She did, actually. She came to the prison one day dressed as an old lady selling apples. She said she'd admit she hadn't disappeared if I gave her five dollars. I didn't have it. It's a shame. Yes, it was. She needed the money badly. Her husband, the janitor, was suffering from a dread malady caused by flies. Well, gee, that's certainly disheartening. Yes, but uh, you were suffering in that jail, too, weren't you, as I remember? Well, it's not too bad if you get a good cell. Mine was under a furnace. Oh. And I guess no one believed you when you told them that you were innocent. Well, I protested for a while, but I soon stopped that when they poured hot lead on my elbow. Well, that's terrible. I feel rotten oh, about all cut this. it out. Cut it out. You'll have me crying. Well, uh, what happened after you got out of prison? Well, the magician's union had taken my card away from me, so I slept in the streets for about three months. And then what happened? I got sick from sleeping in the streets. There's a way to sleep in the streets safely. you got to stay away from where the water runs down the sewer. I was too weak to do that. Oh, gee, that's awful. We're so sorry for reporting you. Stop that. apologizing. No. I straightened out eventually. There was this very nice guy, CPA, who decided he'd take a chance on an ex-con. Gave me a job sweeping his office. Well, that's wonderful. And is that uh, where you're working now? No, no, he emptied out the safe last night, and I believe the police are looking for me. Well, Mr. Tuckering, we're not going to report you this time. How's that for being good sport? That's well. And about that first mistake, relax. Could have happened to anybody. You find that's why they put erasers on pencils. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Tuckering, and thanks for being with us. And folks, be with us again soon when we try to cover up another one of our mistakes. Wally Ballou is at Gopher Hole, Minnesota this week, where he's with Game Warden Lester Fink, who have a very exciting uh, broadcast for us now. Standing by with our remote equipment way up there in Minnesota, Wally Ballou. Think King of the Forest Preserve here, and we're going to ask him a few uh, questions to do with the whooping crane, which I understand, sir, is just about due. Well, we're due to see one for the first time. Wally, I'd suggest that you talk in hushed tones because we're going to get as close as we dare get to the uh, whooping cranes. They have very sensitive ears, eyes, and 
noses. We'll try to uh, speak as quietly as we can. We're standing on the edge of a clearing, and uh, to the far end, there is a water hole, which, as I understand it, is where the whoopy cranes meet and whoop it up. <laughs> huh? oh, I stepped right up to my knees and uh, helped me out of this thing. Yeah. Right over the top of my boots. Oh, that's an awful feeling. Yes, yeah, so we'll slosh around with those well, for the rest of the time. I think right now, if, if you look, if you look through these I can't bushes, see much of anything. You can probably see the whooping crane in their famous mating dance. I wonder if our parabolic microphone can pick up some of the... Uh, let's just be quiet. I think now, that's the male. You'll hear him dance about, and then he'll cry. Can we tell the Give difference the... between the male and the female by the dancing of their feet? Yes, yeah, so, well, it's not the... Uh, you can't tell the difference. Well, I mean, are the females any lighter on their feet? Well, they're... I would assume they uh, are, but uh-huh. uh, it would only be an ounce or so different. Yeah. Now, I want you to listen right here now. You will hear the famous mating call of the whooping crane when the dancing stops. All right. What happens now? That's it. Then we've heard it. You've heard it, I think, probably for the first time. Forty miles into the northern Minnesota forest land by foot, we have been listening to the mating call of the whooping cranes with Assistant Forest Preserve Master Lester Fink. Thank you very much, sir, for thinking this. You can speak right up now loud. Yeah, I see they've, they don't pay any attention to us at all. I think we could have spoken up this loud all the way through, but we hope you heard it. And, uh, well, let's start back. It's, it's a, a four-day trip back, so... Come on, let's go. Welcome once again to the book review of the airwaves. Today's guest is Mr. Dylan Bellwether, author of How to Live Longer by Staying Calm in Certain Situations, which demand a good deal of tolerance and foresight. Say, that's quite a title, Mr. Bellwether. Yes, I got around to it by making my publisher print the book with two front covers. I had to fight them like Billy Mitchell on that count. Well, I read your book, and I can say it certainly is an aid to people who flare up at the slightest provocation. How long did it take you to write the book? About eight years. I know that's a long time to write a book, but you've got to remember that the book runs a good 30 pages, and there were other reasons why it took as long as it did to write. Well, what reasons, sir? Well, the wife and kids were around a lot of the time, and that can be distracting. But, of course, with your background of knowing how to stay calm in emergencies, I imagine you just shrugged off whatever distractions there were and kept Some of them I did, but there were times when I got plenty angry, I'll admit. I once hit my wife with a broom. Why'd you do that, sir? Well, she provoked me one day when she asked me for a dollar so she could buy a new dress. Well, I think any man would have done what you did in the same situation. Sure they would. And the kids didn't make it any easier either. Well, how do they try your temper? Well, I hate kids, so I think I might be a bit prejudiced on the matter. Nothing personal in it, though. Anyway, back in 1956, I was hard at work on my book, and I wanted to get rid of the kids. And I figured most kids seem to enjoy swamps. Get in all that muck, and they seem to have a real good time in it. So I was all for sending the kids to a swamp for the summer, and I sent them to one. Three days later, they came back begging for food. Well, that would make any man lose his temper. Yes, the kids seemed to have an abrasive quality that grated on my nerves. It was a battle, all right. Well, the important thing is that you finished your book, and it seems to be selling quite well. Who told you it was selling well? Well, isn't it on the bestseller list? No, and it never was. Books on how to calm yourself are a drug on the market these days. And frankly, mister, I'd hoped you'd be a little better prepared for this interview. Well, I was given the information by one of my research staff. Usually, he's very dependable. Well, he's dead wrong this time. Mm-hmm. I, I had to fight the midtown traffic to get here. It's a shame you guys aren't more on the ball. I'd just as soon leave right now and let you fill in with organ music. It would serve you right. Well, now, uh, calm down, Mr. Bellwether. Uh, we did the very best well, we could. Well, you think so. Let me tell you something right now. You're a clod. 
You always were and you always will be. I've listened to this program for years, and each time I hear your voice, I break the radio. Well, Von Monroe does that, too. Don't get funny with me, mister. The more crack than you'll get a smart rap on the nose. Well, sir, this is precisely the situation covered in the first chapter of your book, How to Deal with an Unprepared Radio Interviewer After Having Fought Midtown Traffic. I'd like to rip that chapter right out of the book. It's all nonsense, and so are you. Thank you for appearing in our microphone, Mr. Dylan Bellwether, author of How to Live Longer by Staying Calm in Situations Which Demand a Good Deal of Tolerance and Foresight. I must say that uh, Ray and I have been overwhelmed and completely taken by surprise by the reaction to the Thurber Whitechapel uh, telephonic stories which uh, have been coming over the line the past uh, few weeks, all as a result of uh, meeting him on a tour some weeks back. He went back to his home in North Chicago and has been calling in uh, ever since with little human stories of things that happened to him. He's on the phone now, and uh, Thurber Whitechapel, what is our story about this week? Hello there, Bob, and hello there, Ray, and hello there, everybody who enjoys my telephonic story. Well, a great many people do, Thurber. We've had uh, letters and uh, phone calls. People stop us on the street. They say, hey, how about those Thurber Whitechapel phone calls, stories? And uh, we say, yeah, how about it? And they all seem to like them. So I guess we'll have to continue. Well, that's the encouraging to hear. I'd like to tell the story of the time I was on a wine testing tour. Uh, it was very interesting, and uh, I thought you might like to hear about that. Well, it sounds as if it would. If you can just keep it short, that's been our big problem. Uh, your stories do ramble a little bit, and uh, they run over our accustomed time period. So you have about a minute here. If you can tell us a crisp, concise story. Wrap it up in a nutshell inside of a minute. We'll be real happy here. Well, I was on this wine testing tour through uh, Gary, Indiana, about, oh, it was about three years ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, we were trying to find uh, a new white wine that uh, we had heard rumored uh, was being uh, raised and grown there in Gary, Indiana. You mean the grapes for it were? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I had this old Marmon touring car. I don't know if you're familiar with those cars. Yes, I remember but, uh, those. Uh, mm-hmm. They were a very, very well-engineered uh, automobile, mm-hmm. and uh, they're antiques now. Well, there are several uh, in, in good operating order. That, well, this uh, one uh, wasn't, and mm-hmm. that's another part of the story. Mm-hmm. I arrived uh, in uh, Gary, Indiana. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I wasn't in the mood to go right out to the famous Gary Vineyards at that hour. A little too early to test the, test the grape, huh? Right. So uh, I went in town, and uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned... Uh, did I ever tell you about Porky McNichol, a fellow who usually travels with me on these... Uh, no, uh, I don't think you've uh, mentioned him, but I think you're getting off on another story here. And uh, we are getting the old speed-up uh, signal which means that we've got to draw this to a close. Can you can you finish it, or shall we call you back? Because I think you like better crazy. call me back because I've got Porky in here now, and uh, he went off on a little side trip that I think is more than interesting. All right, well, uh, Thurber, we'll uh, call you back in uh, a little while and uh, see if we can get the wrap-up of your story for this week. Quickly now, let's get on the phone and uh, welcome back uh, Thurber Whitechapel out there in Chicago, who will uh, uh, wrap up the story he began a little while ago. I dropped the stopwatch, and uh, chances are now I won't be able to keep an accurate well, check on this Well, they'll let us know in the control room. Otherwise, they'll just cut us off, and then we'll find out. Thurber, are you there? Yeah, we'll see Porky McNichol. At this time, was driving the Marmon. Uh, just to uh, bring the folks up to date, you were on a wine testing tour through Gary, Indiana. Is that right? That's right. And uh, Porky was helping you out. Porky and I were down there trying to uh, uh, trace uh, this particularly uh, delicious white wine. Now, you said Porky took a side trip uh, and that that was quite interesting. Right. He let me off at, uh, do you know Gary at all? Not at all. No, I don't. Well, it's... Uh, it's a very nice city, and he let me off downtown in Gary, and uh, he said, I'm going to take a little uh, side trip, uh, 
That's what he called it, hmm? That's what he called me, Herb. I mean, that's what he called what he was going to do, a side trip. A side trip. And he said, I'll meet you back here in about an hour, an hour and a half. I said, well, uh, don't hurry back. I said, I'm tired now from the long trip from uh, north of Chicago down to Gary. It isn't too long a trip, but it was enough to tire me. Uh-huh. And uh, uh-huh. I said, don't hurry back. Porky, I said, I'm going to go up to the uh, hotel room now. I'll check in. I'll check in for you. And, get another stopwatch. Uh, I'll bring the, uh, uh-huh. the luggage into the hotel. I said, and I'll get a little uh, little rest. I said, uh, chances are that uh, maybe today I uh, won't feel like going out to the vineyards. Well, get that other stopwatch. I said watch that uh, yeah. maybe oh, I uh, somebody else I'll get the rest and uh, good, tonight good. maybe could go to a movie or something. And then tomorrow, uh, get up early uh, uh, and go right out to the famed vineyards uh, where we uh, hope to uh, to uh, trace this white wine I was speaking of. Wonderful. Good news. Thanks, sir. Uh, and, uh, 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 so okay. with that, uh, I, I got out of the, uh, the Marmon, and uh, he handed, uh, you know, we have the, it's an old-fashioned touring car, this Marmon, and we had the luggage uh, on the uh, running boards, and... Uh, just as I reached to take this handbag off the running board, uh, he, he put it into reverse gear and uh, left the clutch out rather rapidly. So uh, it turns out I made this side trip with him. Oh, I see. You took the uh, trip together and... Uh, well, uh, Did you find the, the new kind of grapes or whatever it was? And uh, uh, he didn't know uh, I mean, that I, I was with him. Oh, I see. Me. Thurber, uh, here again we've run into the old problem of uh, just no more time. Yeah. But uh, maybe next week you can call back and continue it. Maybe not. Who knows? Well, thank you, and I'm awfully uh, glad that these are being so well received by the people across the country. Well, I think they're nice. uh, very interesting stories and uh, brought <laughs> Oh, excuse me, we're on the air here now, Bob. Gee, I didn't and see that coming at all. Right here, we wanted to uh, go over the lost and found items. We do this every once in a while. People who uh, visit us here at the tour uh, have left things behind, and every once in a while, we go on the air with the list. Now, uh, you have until 5 o'clock the following day to get here and claim your item. Now, all you have to do is identify it, identify yourself, and the item is yours. We want you to get back to things that... You have lost, of course. Now, what do we have? We have one fireless cooker mm-hmm. that was left here. That was left uh, about two and a half weeks ago, I think. That's right. It's in fairly good shape. And if you could, uh, there's a serial number on it. If you come and uh, give us the serial number, the fireless cooker is yours. Here is a uh, model storm window. Evidently, a storm window salesman uh, came through here on a tour with his little uh, miniature storm window. It, it's in perfect working condition. It uh, shouldn't be of any particular value to anyone other than a storm window salesman, but uh, if it is yours, please come and claim it. We have one... <clears throat> well, that <a, clears throat> appears to be a cowbell. I don't know whether that was lost or it's up here from sound effects. But if you could come and uh, claim it, <clears throat> it's yours. We also have a one of those space shoes. It's the left one, and there's a, there's a cut in the side for a bunion. Naturally, this would only fit one foot, probably, because they're all molded, of course, to individual feet. Obviously, this person's foot. foot's uh, changed after he got his space shoes a little. Uh, we have a geranium plant that's in full bloom. Now, this would be very difficult to transplant, of course, but in the pot, it is in good shape, mm-hmm. as good as we found it, of course. And we have four star rubies that, uh, in, in a setting with the diamonds. These, I'm afraid, nobody would be able to uh, to identify. identify and, of them. course, as is the custom, anything that you can't identify uh, becomes uh, our property. Oh, and there's an original Matisse. Another original Matisse. This, I'm sure you cannot identify either. Okay, that's the lost and found for this week. If you've uh, lost anything here, you be sure to listen for this little feature from time to time. How you doing, weather fans? Time now to take a look at it, the weather that is, and to call in the Bob and Ray official weather forecaster who is stationed atop Mount Washington in the state of New Hampshire. Come in, please. 
Clifford Fleming. It's summer, Dave, and we certainly are enjoying it. I hope that uh, all of your weather fans will be taking advantage of uh, the warm sunshine and the blue skies overhead and the green grass underneath. Well, that's where it usually is. Cliff, tell me, what is the general outlook now for the next few uh, days? Dave, uh, we look forward to some very pleasant weather. Weather for uh, beach going, for uh, picnicking, for driving in the country, Dave, and all like of that. Uh, I hear the whistle again, indicating that you the are mountain fever, Dave. coming down with mountain fever. Uh, how long has it been since you've been down to sea level? Uh, Dave, I, I think it was sometime in May was the, was the last time. Uh-huh. And, I uh, think it probably would be a good, uh, maybe a preventative practice for you to maybe every two weeks climb into your little uh, go-kart and uh, come down the side of the mountain to sea level so uh, to avoid uh, this mountain fever. Yeah, and uh, I... I said... I know, I heard you. <laughs> Well, anyway, Dave, I hope uh, that you'll be able to take some time off that you and the missus and uh, uh, everybody up there in the big city uh, will be able to enjoy the weather we're, we're giving them. How is uh, Miss Fleming? Miss Fleming is fine, Dave. Sends her best to you. Well, give my best to your war department, too. And uh, it's been nice talking with you, Cliff, and I gather then that we'll have nice weather for a while. That's about the size of it, Dave. Okay, you've been listening, cut it, engineer, to Clifford Fleming, Bob and Ray's private weather forecaster, stationed atop Mount Washington in New Hampshire. We have a gentleman uh, here at the microphone now who claims to have a very interesting occupation. What did you say your name was? Eldon Drift Bank. And what is the occupation, please? I'm a lake remover. <laughs> well, what does that job entail, Eldon? Well, for different reasons. People sometimes want lakes removed. I do the job. I'm in business for myself. You have a store? No, just a pump. That does the trick just about as well as anything. Is this a well-paying job? Uh, no. Actually, it's a losing proposition. There are a lot of expenses involved in removing a lake. Mm -hmm. The expenses of what sort? Well, the uh, thing is, when you remove a lake, it had better be in the right direction. Well, why is that? Well, suppose I removed a lake, say, 100 yards from where it was. There'd be a new lake where there wasn't one before, right? I suppose so, yeah. Well, now, uh, the lake would be sitting on another man's property, and suppose he didn't like the lake. Well, I see what you mean. You'd have to remove the lake again if uh, somebody didn't like where you put it. That's the idea. What happens in a case like that? Well, nothing to do but just keep on going. With the same lake? That's right. It can get uh, pretty rough sometimes. There was uh, one time a man in Texas asked me to remove an unsightly lake from his property. Well, I was uh, got down there and got to moving that lake around, and there were a lot of people who didn't like where I put it. And I can tell you, I was kept pretty busy for a while. Well, I don't see why people would object to a lake. I should think it would add to the real estate value of their property. Well, this lake I was fooling with at the time wasn't really a decent-looking lake. It was all muddy. didn't have any fish in it. It was no good for swimming or anything. Uh -huh. Well, what happens when you remove a nice-looking lake? Nothing. It just stays there, and people go fishing and swimming in it. In a case like that, my job is done. Some of those satisfied people were pretty nice to me. One of them invited me into his house for a limeade. That was very kind of him. Oh, uh, can you remember what the toughest job you ever had uh, as a lake remover was? Well, it was this rotten-looking lake in Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. And the owners couldn't stand to look at it, so I was called in. I started to remove the lake in a northerly direction. And I guess uh, with a rotten lake like that, you had to keep going, huh? I sure did. Lucky thing I had my trailer with me. I did plenty of traveling that year. Where did the lake eventually wind up, sir? In Hudson's Bay in Canada. It was quite a trip. <laughs> Must have been. Well, what happened when you got to Hudson's Bay? Did you find somebody who was satisfied with the lake? No, uh, that was a bad lake. For a while, I thought it'd have to go straight on up to the Arctic Circle, you know, with that baby. Uh, but the weather turned cold, and the lake froze. So I just picked up the pieces and threw them into a trash can. Good riddance, too. Well, if the ice thaws out in the summertime, uh, is it going to be your responsibility to remove it again? Well, why don't you leave well enough alone, huh? Haven't I had enough trouble as a lake remover? I guess you have had your troubles. That's right. No home life at all. Well, thanks for appearing with us here at our Bob and Ray microphone, Mr. Drift Bank, and why don't you go for a swim? A very 
interesting remote broadcast now from Orient Point in Boston, where Wally Ballou is standing by to tell you all about it. Come in, please. Wally Ballou. Video's ever-traveling Wally Ballou at Orient Point in Boston, Massachusetts, at the home of the rubber chopstick in America. Happy Charlie's Joke Factory, and Charlie is standing here with me now to explain some of the things that are turned out daily here for export to the Orient. Charlie, uh, you are known as the king of the rubber chopsticks, is that right? That's right. What, we uh, make all kinds of things here, little gags and things that uh, sell very big in the Orient. Is that so? <clears throat> Certainly we've stumbled on... Uh, an unusual uh, branch of uh, fun making, I would say. How long have you been in business here? Uh, since the war, I got the idea when I came home one time and uh, some of the kids had put those uh, rubber fried eggs on a plate for me. Oh, yes, I've and, seen uh, those in our own joke shops. That's right, and it gave me the idea that uh, there's plenty of jokes in this country like rubber chocolates and uh, things like that. Yeah. But, uh, maybe in other parts of the world I could, you know, merchandise some of these items that would be peculiarly... Uh, uh, needed there. So you've adapted the idea <laughs> for uh, export items for the Orient, like the rubber chopsticks, which I imagine caused a great laugh. That's when right. Somebody tries to pick up there. We have a new right item now. on the uh, chopstick now, uh, Mr. Ballou, that uh, is uh, going to be, I think, uh, even bigger than the rubber. Uh, What's chopstick. that, uh, Happy? It's hinged in the middle, a little hidden hinge in the middle of in the, the chopstick. In the middle of the chopstick, so it just breaks away there. It just kind of breaks away as they bring it up, uh, bring the food up to their mouths. What are some of the other things you turn out here that uh, get big laughs of the uh, inscrutable East? Well, we have uh, some plastic spare ribs. That's uh, a good one. It looks uh, real uh, genuine, and I understand that that's a popular number over there, too. I understand, too, that uh, you told me you make exploding opium pipes. Is that another of the items you... That's right. Out? We have a little, little hidden uh, charges in there, like uh -huh. a cap that blows up. Gets a big laugh. We have plastic egg roll with uh, shredded plastic filling. Boy, I'll bet that's hard to detect until you well, take a good bite of it. We're going to take it off the market. A lot of them are eating them. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, you would run into that kind of trouble, but it's all in the spirit of good, clean fun. And maybe you can expand your activities to other countries, like like uh, Germany or Norway, something like that. Or Italy. Or Italy. I mean, I can visualize... Uh, Plastic pieces. Or lasagna. Yeah. There's a, there's, there's, a, there's a crying need for this, Wally, and I think that I've got something going good for myself here. Good. Happy Charlie. Thank you very much in the interest of good, clean fun around the world. This is Wally Ballou at Orient Point. Page four, entertainment. And here are Claude and Clyde McBeebe, the McBeebe twins and their orchestra. Hi, fellas. Hello there, Bob, Bob and Ray. Ray. It's good, good to, to uh, be, back be back here, here in the big, big city. city. Well, it's wonderful to have you here, and I presume that you're right in the middle of your busy season traveling from town to town with your new augmented orchestra, the new sound of the McBeebe's. The new the sound, sound of the McBeebe, Bob, Bob, is the bell on our custard truck. What is what? The bell on our on custard, custard truck. truck. You're driving a custard truck? Right. right. The, uh, the music, music business, business, uh, business uh, just will just not will support, not support a, a, a large organization, organization such, such as ours. ours. Whereas, Whereas people, people will support, support a custard, a custard truck, truck. Well, in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. In this warm weather, of course, the frozen custard, I presume, is what you're talking about. It's a very welcome sight to see that uh, wagon, but it's quite Vanilla, a far jump. Vanilla, chocolate, chocolate, and, and uh, uh, strawberry. Fruity, fruity. What? Strawberry. Fruity, fruity. Strawberry. Well, let's get together. Fruity, fruity. Uh, uh, you oh, have he's all right. It is fruity, 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 fruity this, week. this week. It'll be, It'll strawberry, be strawberry next week. Next week. You're kind of uh, jumping the gun on the specials there, I guess. Do you find that you miss uh, getting up there on the bandstand every night and... Waving the old batons and... No, we no, still, we do, still that. do that. We, we uh... uh <laughs> when well, isn't driving... Driving. Uh, yeah, get you up, up on the seat, seat and more or less leave the, the bell. With well, the baton. With the baton. Well, it's, uh... Must look rather humorous. I suppose it does attract business, though. It, it does. does. Uh, uh, we're a well, welcome, welcome, happy, happy sight. Right. When we turn when we up Pine Street, Street. About quarter seven at night. Right up by the firehouse. We sell, we sell probably, probably 11, 11 or 12, 12 right, right there. there. Well, that's uh, 
Seven cents. Seven cents. How much do you... Uh, uh, how, how does your take from the uh, custard wagon, for instance, compare with your take uh, on the road with a with a big band? Can well, you give us any figures? Yes. yes. If uh, uh, you'd go back, go back to those Halcyon, Halcyon days, days, days of name, name band, band, when we had when our, we had name, our band, name band, uh, band uh, we, used to make, we used to make uh, oh, three, three to eight thousand dollars a night. A now, of course, we make uh, fifteen, 15 to twenty dollars so a week. A difference. A week. Well, that, that is a rather different, but you're happy. We've and adjusted uh, to, to uh, the, uh, the uh, cutting income, income, and, income. and, uh, and uh, we're, we're now finding now happiness, in, happiness other in other things. Needing a lot of ice cream. Okay, I hope that uh, maybe things will look up for you and that uh, you'll be back there uh, swinging out with that new sound. The well, McKinney only twins and I can, can tell. tell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here now, two old friends of ours, two of the nation's great big band names and two of the biggest names in the frozen custard business today, the McBeebe Twins and their orchestra. Hi, Phone. Hello again, Hello again man. Uh, Bob, Bob Ray. Ray. It's great, it's great to be back, to be back. And the old, old microphone, microphone filling, you filling you in on, on the activities, the activities of, of the McBeebe's. Well, you fellas have certainly got a nice tan. I guess you've been out uh, with the ice cream truck uh, all... Every day that we've had all the sunshine. Oh, that's right. right. And the and evenings. evenings so See, we have we a have canvas, canvas top, top over the over cab ply of the, the uh, custard, custard truck. truck. And, and uh, we get a lot, a lot of sunshine. sunshine. A lot of, a lot fresh, of fresh air. air. Oh, oh uh, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, also, also expanded, expanded our, our activities. activities. That's all. We have we a, have a small, small griddle where we can whip up a hot dog in a bun. Well, that's, uh, that's good. That should double the, the income, and uh, maybe you can even start with a fleet or of... or without. Or without, must it. Uh, maybe you can have a... Take a lily. Uh, a fleet of uh, these things. Maybe you've started on a, a business that'll turn out to be even more successful than your famed orchestral group. Well, uh, well that, of course, that, of course, is, is uh, in the back of our minds. And, and uh, uh, if we if can we expand, can expand we get two or two, three, three trucks... trucks of course, we'd course, need, we uh, need uh, drivers. drivers. Uh, uh, how, about how about you and uh, uh, Ray, Ray, Bob? Um, well, I mean, uh, mean during, uh, the week. during the week. Well, we're I know you're busy, busy here. here. It's, uh, it's, uh, lucrative for you, beckoning to you. Well, I appreciate the offer. I'll speak to Ray about it when he uh, turns up. But I don't think uh, I would count on it if I were you. We, we do have to sit around and do a lot of writing and preparing. Uh, staff meetings, board meetings, things like that. Even though we are only on the air these few hours, you see. Well, then, well, can we look for you next Monday? Next in Monday, that case? In that case? Oh, I guess so. Uh, as I said, I'll speak to Ray and I'll give you a call. Well, wow. glad to have yeah, you glad aboard. Glad to have you aboard the pie wagon. The McBeebe twins and their custard pie wagon. And uh, we'll report to you later on how we made out. So long, so long and, and 78. 78. We have a gentleman now at the microphone who claims to have a very interesting occupation. What's your name, sir? Elihu Torpid. I was born in Burbank, California. I'm 32 years old and unmarried, and I believe I'll be in city for about a week. Thank you, Mr. Torpid. You certainly are a broadcaster's dream. However, I'm certainly glad you left out your occupation because that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Go ahead. You'll find me amenable. That's what I'm here for. Well, you're certainly chatty. I guess if all guests cooperated the way you do, I'd be out of a job. Oh, no. You won't (laughs) find me malicious or anything like that. Uh, At any rate, will you tell our listeners what you do do for a living? Certainly. I'm a monster maker. You know all those frightening guys you see in the movies all made up? Incidentally, they really aren't monsters. They're people made up to look that way. Well, I suspected that. How did you ever happen to uh, get a job like that? I mean, you don't see many want ads and that sort of thing. Well, no, you don't. Well, I was raising ferrets out in Burbank, and I found there wasn't much money in it, so I decided to make a switch. What did you do then? Well, as you know, there are quite a few movie studios out in Hollywood. I don't know if you know that. Yes, I did. So I visited one of the studios, Bad Looking Pictures. Uh, They Mm -hmm. specialize in monster films. Uh, they gave me a job making up monsters. Well, you didn't have any experience, sir. How did you manage to get the job? There are ways. 
It's been my experience that if you can keep your mouth shut and your nose clean, there's very little a man can't do. Uh, well, let me put it to you this way. Aren't there a great many people around today working at jobs they don't know anything about? Admit that, will you? Well, if you put it that way, no, I... No, I'm right. I guess so, Mr. Torpid. But now, how did you uh, go about... How do you go about making a, making up a month? Well, now, uh, that depends on the picture. If it's uh, local earth stuff, and by that I mean werewolves, vampires, or Frankenstein monsters, it's uh, easy because I got something to go on. I know what they look like. For example, a werewolf can pretty much be copied from a cat's face. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then all I got to do is uh, get out the hair and the celluloid teeth, and I got the job with. You actually make it sound easy. Well, sir. it is, up to a certain point. It's the monsters from outer space that give me all the trouble. Oh, why is that? Well, well, use your head, man. There's no starting point when I make up a monster from outer space. Nobody knows what they're supposed to look like. Oh, I see. Well, what do you do in a case like that? Well, I make them up out of my own head. I got a commendation from L.B. Overmeyer in the last one I did. In this picture, the Martians land here and don't have any brains. Mm-hmm. And it was my job to show that they didn't have any brains. Oh, that must have been quite a challenge. How did you do that? I made their heads out of plate glass, and you could look right in and not even see a single brain cell. It was a coup, all right. It certainly was. I've got to admire you for your ingenuity. I suppose your services will be in great demand when this picture is released. Ordinarily, I would agree, but this picture isn't going to be released. Why not? Well, the story department fumbled this one. Now, how can the Martians land here in spaceships if they don't have any brains? Yeah, the studio does have a problem there. You bet they do. Well, thank you for being with us anyway, Mr. Torpid, and I certainly hope the studio finds a solution. Thank you. And now time for another remote broadcast with Wally Ballou. This time Wally is in Clinton, Massachusetts. Into Massachusetts, of the Dashua River, this is Radio's Wally Ballou. We've brought our radio equipment here to cover the annual Gertie's Regatta, which is an event of local interest, but one which we feel everyone else should uh, have uh, a cognizance of. I'm standing on the banks of the Dashua River, which uh, looks uh, somewhat muddy at this particular point, probably due to several of the uh, viewers having tripped uh, further up the river and riled up the, the mud just a bit. Gertie is uh, over here, and I've been promised a few words. Gert, uh, you are somewhat of a local character, is that right? Well, that's right. Most people figure me for one of those local nuts, but uh, I do good things. Well, you're lovable. Thank and they you. have named uh, this uh, annual event after you, of course. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the regatta and what we can look for? Well, Gertie's regatta started back in 1905, and, and so that would make it 53 years old. Is it really? And uh, right now, as you can see down here from your vantage point, the famous dinghy relay is on. I see. That's the, the opening portion of the entire day's activities. That's right. And then we have a regular raft race. Some of the local uh, youngsters have built their own rafts, and they go by uh, several times, and one who goes by the fastest, uh-huh. according to our stopwatch, Are they permitted to is have the winner and to... will receive the Gertie Lloyd Trophy. Wonderful. That will be engraved to the winner. His name will be on it, and then my name will be on it uh-huh. in the year. Are they permitted to use sails on the rafts? Or no, no, to... they have to use either a long pole... Or a, a paddle of some sort. Sails are out. And then tonight, to celebrate, there's a big oh, bean supper, I understand. Yes, and then, of course, the famous regatta dance at the Armory. Certainly is a day that uh, all of Clinton looks forward to, and all of the devotees of this type of sport uh, turn out for. We've been getting Gertie's regatta story. Here at Clinton, Massachusetts, and our thanks to all who made possible this radio broadcast. Now we'll pack our equipment. Welcome now to the Bob and Ray Geriatrics Corner, the feature that attempts to create better understanding between employers and some of our senior citizens. Employers would do well to hire some of these people. 
Isn't that right, elderly Mr. Elmer Garvis? It was right during the days of the Cleveland Gold Rush, too. Cleveland? Uh, yes, not too many people know about that. Did you know that silver was once discovered in Philadelphia? No, I didn't. Sir, may I first respectfully ask your age? Well, I'm a bit vain about that. Let's just say that uh, I'm over 98 and under 120. Well, Mr. Garvis, uh, to what do you attribute your reaching the age of 98 or over? Work. Keep working. Right now I'm doing some freelance longshoreman work down on the docks. Wasn't that kind of strenuous work for a man of your age? Not if you know how to swing a bailing hook. There's a trick to it, you know. What is the trick? You can go whistle in your hat, Sonny. I understand, sir. Mr. Garvest, are you married? No, I divorced my wife about 80 years ago. Actually, the divorce isn't legal yet. I'm waiting for the final papers to come through. Then you'll be a free man. Free as a bird. Is there any chance for a reconciliation, do you think? Not as far as I'm concerned. I met her recently in a Cuban hotel. That's when we were having the trouble down there about a battleship that was blown up. Mm -hmm. She carried on and all like that about her wanting to stay married, I mean. So uh, I got her a job on a sugar plantation instead. And I've had no trouble from her since. You mentioned before that you were doing freelance longshoreman work. Do you look for other jobs in your spare time? Yes, I do. Do you find employers hesitate in hiring a man over 98? They sure do, yes. Well, what do you think the reason for that might be? Well, it's hard for me to say. Just last week, I applied for a job as a typist and got turned down. That seems unfair. Not really. You see, I don't type at all. But when you get on, the idea is to keep busy. Ephraim Stoker taught me that. Boy, he works like a beaver. Who's uh, Ephraim Stoker? Well, he's a friend of mine, twice as old as I am, and he really gets around. What sort of work does he do? Uh, he's in show business. I believe he's scheduled to appear here at your own Latin Quarter next week. Boy, it's hard to believe a man that old uh, can be in show business. What kind of an act does he do? Well, uh, first he comes out and shows some relics from the old days. Muskets, powder horns, things like that. And then he hits them with the one line in his act. What does he say? Well, it's more for historians than a nightclub audience, but he tells them that at the Battle of Yorktown, General Cornwallis had rickets and was unfit to fight. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Garvis. And incidentally, do you want to be driven home in a magnificent limousine provided by the self-drive people? No, I think I'll run up to Washington Heights. That's where I live. Well, you suit yourself, sir. And welcome once again to the Bob and Ray Beg Your Pardon Show. As serious news gatherers and reporters... We are prone to mistakes, of course. Names and addresses can be quite important in reporting a story. We get it wrong a lot of the time. And sometimes people's lives are affected by these minor lapses. And so we thought a public apology to some of the innocent people who are hurt by our irresponsible reporting deserved a public apology. And we have one of these damaged people with us today. Mr. Edgar Forney. We're sorry, sir. Well, that's all right. Right here, I'd like to tell our listeners that we erroneously used Mr. Forney's name in connection with a bank holdup six years ago. The man who held up the bank was a Mr. Edgar Forley. Tell us what's happened since that time, Mr. Forney. Well, of course, the police had uh, already arrested the right man. Well, that was a break for you, I of suppose so. But my neighbors gave me a pretty rough time. They started booing and hissing me, and later I was stoned by them. Well, we're sorry to hear about that. Oh, it's all right. It's all in the game. I don't trust a man who's never made a mistake anyway. Well, uh, what happened after that? Well, I lost my job at the department store. A lot of angry people threw bolts of silk at me in that instance. I hope you'll forgive us. Oh, it was an honest mistake. Forget it. The important thing is, you meant well, and that counts for a lot. Anyhow, after that, I had to move to Cleveland. I wanted a fresh start. What happened there? It seems they'd heard of me out there, too. So, to avoid being hit by things, I kind of had to hide out. Took an apartment between the third and fourth floor of a house. Gee, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Don't blame yourself thing is, it wasn't so great in the hideout. I had to stay there 24 hours a day. Well, how did you eat? I didn't for a long time. I got pretty sick. Landlady discovered me on the floor one day. I asked her to call a doctor, but she recognized me and called the immigration authorities instead. You know, I feel rotten about that. Don't start pitying yourself. It can get you in trouble. Well, what happened then, sir? I was deported to Vienna. That's the city of waltzes, you know. So I've heard. Uh, did they know you there? Yes, but I wasn't stoned there. Quite a few of the people took canes to me, though. That's a shame. What happened after that? 
Well, I bummed around quite a bit, trying to find a place where I wasn't known. Well, uh, what are your plans now that you're back here in the States? I really don't know. I might settle in St. Petersburg, Florida. Most of the people who live down there are well into their 80s. They're a little too weak to do much damage. Well, is there any way we can make up for what's happened to you? We readily admit that it was all our fault. Look, mister, stop blaming yourself. Keep on doing that, you're going to have a breakdown. What's done is done. Forget it. Well, in that case, all we can do here on the Beg Your Pardon show is offer a public apology. And we humbly do so. We're sorry, Mr. Edgar Forley. I accept your apology, and incidentally, the name is Forney, not Forley. I'm sorry. And be with us again Same next week, folks, made the first when we're trying to cover thing. up another one of our mistakes. Our researchers have <clears throat> come up with another very unusual occupation, and uh, to tell us about it, will you step up to the microphone, Mr. Edgar Verfile? Well, I'm glad you said it was an occupation. There are lots of people who'd call it uh, an avocation. There's a difference, you know. I know it. Mr. Verfile, would you tell the listeners at home what you do for a living? Sure. I'm a movie wit. Organizations hire me to haul a different sayings in the movie house to pep things up. Well, like what, sir? Well, like in a war picture, say there's a destroyer chasing a submarine, and the commander of the destroyer gives an order to throw out a few depth bombs. Mm -hmm. Well, as soon as the depth bombs are released, I holler, Look out! Here they come! You just shout it out, is that it? Well, I give it more emotion in a movie house. Well, you can understand that. Yes. Now, what happens uh, when you do shout like that? Well, it intenses the audience, gives them a few laughs. And uh, we can all use a few laughs. Yes. Oh, well, there are a few people who complain to the usher, but he's usually told in advance that I'm there as a professional, so I'm left alone. Well, when did you uh, last work at your job, sir? Last night at the Bijou Theater down in Baltimore, I was hired by a fraternal organization known as the Blue Knives of Maryland. And a tougher job I never had. Oh, that's so? How come? Well, it was a movie called Camille that was playing there, and we all thought it was one of those French imports from the sound of the name, you uh -huh. know. But it wasn't. It was a very sad movie about a girl with a cough. I think I saw that one. Well, yeah. it put the organization in a pretty bad mood, see. Everybody was getting restless. A few were even weeping softly, and uh, it was up to me to stop that sort of thing. Gee, from what I remember about the picture, there were very few openings for the sort of thing you do. Yeah, it was tough. I finally had to resort to one of the oldest tricks in my business. What was the old trick you resorted to? Well, in this picture, see, this girl with a cough has a pretty steady boyfriend who keeps coming around to see her. And about the only thing I could do was when the boyfriend kissed her, I made a loud kissing noise. Oh, I've heard that done many times in various movie houses. Well, I just told you it was an old trick. Well, I'll tell you one thing, though. It sure broke the bad mood of the organization. After that, they laughed at everything and had a wonderful time. Boy, I can see why your job must keep you pretty busy, sir. Well, I see as many as 50 or 60 movies a week. It keeps me hopping, but it gets rougher every day. I remember back in 48, all I had to do to get an audience crazy was to pretend to snore during an action scene. Mm -hmm. But uh, they want more these days. And then there are the non-pro guys in the movie house who make people laugh on their own, you know? Yeah. When that happens, the organization doesn't pay me. Well, it sounds at best like a slender situation to me. Why don't you branch out into the legitimate theater field? Well, I tried that once several years ago at a musical called uh, Carousel. I let go a loud raspberry during one of the songs some guy was singing. And you never saw such a commotion. I was being flogged by theater programs until an usher came along and saved me. Now, there's nothing there for me. I gotta go undo to pep up a picture called the... Uh, the Ten Commandments. You know anything about the story? Yeah, I don't think you better make any noises at that one, though. But thanks for being with us today, Mr. Verfile, and very good luck in the near future to you. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? How do you do? It's a real pleasure to be back here with you, and today we're going through some lost and found items that have uh, managed to sift through... To the Bob and Ray desk, which, of course, abuts the foot clinic. <laughs> the uh, summer season, of course, is always great for uh, visitors, and uh, unfortunately for some of them, they have uh, in great abundance left things uh, around, which, as we say, are here on our lost and found table. Here's something here that could be of some value to the person who left it, I'm sure, is a bag, an insulated bag filled with uh, mushrooms. Uh, of course, there's the possibility that they are toadstools, and uh, we don't want to uh, eat them ourselves, this, but I this do... would be a problem. They are uh, highly perishable. So uh, will the toadstool fancier or the mushroom eater uh, who left their uh, 
uh, products here. Please call for it by uh, tonight, midnight. Another item here, Ray Goldsmith. It's uh, probably something of uh, great value. I don't know just uh, how much. It's an original publisher's edition of Walden's Pond, and uh, it has Thoreau's autograph in it. Bob Aarons, uh, we have uh, something else here that I think it's a charcoal cooker. It's a small one with, uh, looks like it would uh, probably do maybe a half a dozen hot dogs or three or four rather plump hamburgers. Well, if anybody wants to get any use out of that before the summer's over, they'd better claim it right away. There's a fifth of old Tanglefoot. It's an American bourbon type of uh, refreshment that was left here. And uh, well, the rightful owner will pass by, give the serial number of it. I'm sure they can have it back. We still have, and we have had for the past several months, this picture of Frank Gallup that nobody seems to claim, and uh, it's in fairly good shape, uh, the picture, and uh, it is yours if you merely can uh, identify it. It has uh, something written on it which you can identify. There is a pencil, a wooden That's lead. mine, that's oh. mine. And that is about it. I think we've got... Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the items listed here, and all you have to do, you know, is uh, drop us a line, and uh, we'll get in touch with you. Welcome to the used car lot of the air. Yes, today's the day we're going to wheel and deal. Ray, what good buys are there on the lot today that are going begging because of foolish resistance on the part of the consumer? Well, we have a 1924 Hupmobile that's been on the lot for a while, and the low, low price on this model is only $12,000. Now, this is a steal. Automatic wheels, removable fenders, self-oiling seats. It's really something you can't afford to overlook. Isn't that the model that comes with a picture of Calvin Coolidge on top of the gear shift? By golly, I think you're right, pal. Mm -hmm. And that alone makes it an irresistible buy. Incidentally, this car was once owned by Fanny Warden, the heiress. Really? Yes. Once? <laughs> yeah, and legend has it that she used to hide all her money in the gas tank. Ah, Lee, I didn't know that. Let's look in the tank now. No, uh, uh, whatever is in the tank belongs to the buyer of this beautiful, magnificent, mechanic gone over Hupmobile. Truly, it's a car that will give you many, many happy hours of motoring in your driveway. Ray, should I tell them about our next giveaway? Or let them no, think about that no. one for a while? <laughs> no, no, you don't. That's my own car, and I refuse to give it up. But I see you're champing at the bit, so go ahead and tell them. Well, this happens to be Ray Goldman's own, Ray, Ray, Ray Goulding. Goulding's own personal car. And wild horses have been dragging it away. So, no, I think you meant wild horses couldn't persuade me... To give up the car. Well, whatever I meant. We're wheeling and dealing on it. It's a foreign import, an Italian libretto, and a real beauty. Seats one and a half people with ease, gets 300 miles on a gallon, and a special fixture prevents the car from going down a sewer while driving in this city. Yes, this Italian import is striking to the eye, too. It stands a neat 14 inches above the ground. And you'll find the disposable clay wheel handy, too. And the handsome interior, lined with specially buffed sandpaper seats, will give you a ride you won't soon forget. Yes, and you'll find that the non-working speedometer in the libretto will save you many hours of needless worry. And, too, you'll be interested in the automatic oil reminder. When you're running low on oil, the engine lays a piston in your lap. And say, Bob, hmm? did you want to tell them the color of the car? Sure. It's a beautiful, colorful, monotone gray. A color selected by the Duke of Alba to match the interior of his son's playroom. And now, how about the price, pal? We're charging $60,000 for this spirited little number, and it's worth twice that much. But... But, uh, what? But since the average motorist has little use for a gold-filled crankshaft, we're willing to remove it at great sacrifice to ourselves and replace it with a wooden one. And that would lower the price considerably, wouldn't it? Yes. It would drop the car down to the range of the average buyer, $412. <laughs> well, gee whiz, do we have to sell it for that little? Afraid so, Ray. And if the Duke of Alba knew about this, he'd challenge me to a duel. And I wouldn't blame him. So, folks, be sure to visit our easy-to-find car lot. And for those of you who are now driving cars purchased at our lot, drive carefully. We know what we're talking about. <laughs> 